Chapter 4 The Boxer I slept late the next morning. To be real honest about it, I didn't wake up till sometime early afternoon. Guess all that monster fighting kind of wore me down. What woke me up was the sound of the flatbed pickup rattling to the gas tank. Right in front of my bedroom, Loper got out and started filling the pickup. He looked at me, gave his head a shake, and said something under his breath. I tried to read his lips, but couldn't make out what he said. Probably wasn't the Pledge of Allegiance. Slim went around to the front of the pickup and opened up the hood. I was just getting up right in the middle of a nice stretch when I heard him say, Hank, come here, boy. Jeez, a friendly voice. How long had it been since someone had spoken to me in a kind voice? In my job, nobody says a kind word when you do something right. Only when you make a mistake, then you hear plenty about it. I trotted to the front of the pickup, limped actually, because I was pretty stove up from the battle. Wigged my tail and said, howdy. Slim bent down and rubbed me behind the ears. Good dog, he said. Good dog? I melted on those words, rolled over on my back and kicked my all, all four legs up in the air. It's amazing what a few kind words and a smile can do for a dog, even as hard-boiled as I am, which is something you have to be in my line of duty. I respond to kindness. Slim rubbed me in that special place at the bottom of my ribs, the one that somehow hooked up to my back leg. Now, I've never understood the mechanics of it, but if a guy scratches me here, it makes my back leg start to kick him. Slim scratched and I kicked. Felt good. Made old Slim laugh. Then he told me to sit. I sat and tried to shake hands. Shaking hands is one of my many tricks I've learned over the years. I can usually count on it to, lie an audi to delight an audience of people. But Slim didn't notice. He reached under the hood, pulled out the dipstick, wiped it off on my ear. Good dog. And that was it. I waited around for more scratching and handshaking, but he seemed to forget I was there. He slammed the hood and stepped on my paw. Oops. Sorry, Hank. Get out of the way. The sweet moments in life are fleeting. You have to enjoy them to the fullest when you can, before some noodle steps on you and tells you to get out of the way. Slim and Loper got into the pickup, and Loper said, Don't you dogs try to follow us. He gunned the motor and pulled away from the tank. Drover suddenly appeared out of nowhere and hopped into the back of the truck. Come on, Hank, we're supposed to go. In the back of my mind, I knew that wasn't right. But I didn't have time to think about it. I chased the pickup till it slowed down for the big hill in front of the house and jumped in the back. Where are we going? I asked. Drover gave me that famous empty-headed look of his the one where you can gaze into his eyes and see all the way out the end of his tail. Then there's nothing in between. Beats me, but I bet we're going somewhere. Loper drove up to the mailbox and turned left. If he had turned right, that meant that we were going to the pasture. A left turn meant we, one thing, we was going to town. And that meant only one thing. Loper was going to be mad as thunder when he found out we jumped in the back and hitched a ride. But what the heck? You can't be safe and cautious all the time. If you're too timid in life, you'll miss out on all the fun and adventure. You'll just stay home and snap at flies. And when you get to be an old dog, you'll look back at your life and think, all those years I've been on this earth and I've never done anything but snap at flies. And you'll regret that. When the opportunity came up, you didn't sneak a ride into town. Drover curled up behind the cab and watched the scenery go by. I sat on my haunches and closed my eyes and just let the wind flap my ears. Felt good, restful. There for a little while, I forgot all my cares and responsibilities. That last time we got to the highway, Loper pulled onto the blacktop and started picking up speed. The wind began to sting my ears, flapped a little harder than I liked them to flap, and the crumbs of alfalfa hay in the pickup bed started to swirl. 
I laid down beside Drover. Say, before I forget, I want to thank you for all the help you gave me last night with that monster. He gave me a shy grin. Oh, that's okay. It was the least I could do. Sure as heck was, if you'd done any leaster, you'd have been fighting for the other side. The shy grin disappeared. You mad about something? Forget it. I didn't want to talk. Alfalfa leaves were getting into my mouth, and I slept all the way to town. Next thing I knew, we slowed down and were coasting down Main Street. I sat up and took in the sights. Bunch of stores and street lights, several stop signs, a couple of town dogs loafing around, big tumble reed rolling down the middle of the street. Loper drove into a parking place in front of the Waterhole Cafe, beside two or three other pickups that looked like cowboy rigs. When we got out and saw us back there, he gave us a tongue lashing. I had expected, but it was no worse than usual. Not bad enough to make me regret that we hitched a ride into town. He told us to sit and be good and don't bark. Then him and Slim went into the water hole. For five or ten minutes, we concentrated on being good, which was a real drag. Then I heard Drover go, Psst! He jerked his head toward the pickup that was parked next to us. In the back end, fast asleep, was a big, ugly boxer dog. We both moved to the side of the pickup bed and stared at him. He must have felt our eyes, because after a bit, his head came up and he glowed at us with a wicked expression on his face. What you staring at? Just looking at the sights, I said, what's your name? Puntain. Ask me again, I'll tell you the same. I guess Grover, Grover didn't understand what that meant, so he asked, what's your name? John Brown. Ask me again, I'll knock you down. Grover gave me a puzzled look, and I said, how come they got you chained up? He was tied to the headache racks of the pickup with a piece of chain. So I won't kill any dogs. You kill dogs? No fooling? Grover asked. Just for drill. I prefer bigger stuff. That sort of ended the conversation with Puddin' Tane went back to sleep and I got involved with a couple of noisy flies that had been bothering my eyes. I took a few snaps at him, but I didn't get anything. Next thing I knew, Drover said, What would you do if we peed on your tires? The boxer's head came up real slow, and he turned him wicked eyes on little Drover. What did you say? I said, What would you do if we peed on your tires? Uh, Drover. Made me a little uneasy the way he was talking about we. The boxer sat up. I tear your legs off and wring your neck. Well, but how could you do that when you're all chained up? Uh, Drover. The boxer lifted one side of his mouth and unveiled a set of long white teeth. I'd bust the chain. Looks pretty stout to me. Drover. It ain't stout enough. Uh, just curious, said Drover. Big and Ugly went back to sleep, and I got back to them flies. One of them was a big, was big and green, also a little slow on the draw. I waited for my shot and snapped. Got the little booger. I had to spit him out real quick. Woo, he did taste foul. Seemed to me I heard water running somewhere. Hmm. I glanced around and saw Big and Ugly's head come up, too. He'd heard it, too. Drover had just wiped out the left rear tire and was going toward the front one. Seemed to me this was poor judgment on Drover's part. The boxer sprang to his feet. Get away from my tire, runt! No two big cow dogs gonna mess up my tires! Well, I didn't like that tone of his voice. I got up and wandered over to the side of the pickup. Say there, partner. Maybe I didn't hear you right. You weren't suggesting that there's any two-bit cow dogs around here, were you? I ain't suggesting, buddy. I'm saying you're a couple of two-bit cow dogs. Do you mean that as an insult or a compliment? Cow dog don't mean one thing to me. Sorry and two-bit. Took a deep breath. Oh dear, Drover, this does seem kind of bad all of a sudden. Why don't you wet down that other tire? He grinned. 
hiked up his leg and let her rip. That boxer went nuts when he saw that. All at once his fangs were flashing in the sunlight. He lunged against the chain and started barking. Big, deep roar of a bark, so loud you could feel it bouncing off your face. I waited for him to shut up. You want to take back what you said about cow dogs? He lunged against the chain and slashed the air about six inches from the end of my nose. I hopped down, skipped around to the right side of the boxer's pickup and wiped out the back tires. Drover and I met in the front, swapped sides and, sides and gave each tire a second coat. Big and ugly went berserk. He fought against the chain and roared, Let me at him! I'll kill him! Just let me at him! Drover and I finished the job, hopped back, in, hopped back into the pickup bed. When the cafe door burst open, we were <coughs> fast asleep. Slim, Loper, and the boxer's master stormed out. What's going on out here, you dogs? Oh, it's my dog, Loper. He's making all that racket. Bruno, shut up. You're disturbing the whole town. I sat up and opened my eyes. Bruno was getting a good scolding from his master. He whined and wagged his stump tail and tried to explain what had happened, but his master didn't understand. Seems to be a common trait in masters. Now lie down and be quiet. I don't want to hear another peep out of you. You know better than that. The men went back inside. I waited a minute and gave Drover the coast is clear sign. We got up and went to the edge of the pickup. Bruno was lying flat with his eyes wide open and a couple of fangs showing beneath his lips. He was trembling with rage. Drover, you ever see an uglier dog than that one? <laughs> no, never did. Me neither. Can you imagine what his mother must have looked like? A growl came up from Bruno's throat. Well, I don't like his pointed ears said Drover. Well, you know why they're pointed, don't you? When boxers are born, they have such big floppy ears, a surgeon has to cut off two yards of hide. Then they whack off the tail. And then they put that pup's face into a shop vise and mash it till it looks just like Bruno's. No kidding? Yep, and you might expect it affects the brain too. Mashes it down to the size of a dog biscuit. The growl in Bruno's throat was growing louder. Well, that's why boxers are so dumb. Brain's been smallered. That's the mark of the breed. They tell me you can't get papers on a boxer unless he's too dumb to walk across the street. They give him a test, see? And all the ones that flunk, they become registered boxers. By this time, the growl had begun a, be, became a steady roar. That's why you never see boxers work cattle. They're just too frazzling and dumb to hold down a steady job. Bruno's eyes were cloudy as if they were filled with smoke from a fire burning inside. His teeth were snapping together. Maybe he was crunching imaginary bones. Why would anybody want a dog that's so big and dumb and ugly? Drover asked. Well, I wondered that myself. I said the only answer I'd come up with is that maybe a guy has a piece of long chain he doesn't know what to do with it, so he'd buy a boxer to hang on it. That did it. Bruno erupted again and lunged at us, his mouth wide open, full of jagged teeth. I got a real good look at his tonsils, which appeared to be a little inflamed. I jerked my head at Drover, and we both set up a line of Z's when then cowboys come out again. Bruno, what in the world? Bad dog. Bad dog. Why can't you just lie still and shut up like these other dogs? Bruno whimpered. I guess we'll have to go. Bruno's on a snort. See you later. When the pickup drove off, me and Drover sat up, grinned, and waved goodbye to our new little friend. Bruno was so mad his eyes were crossed and foam was dripping off his chops. That's what makes being a cow dog worthwhile. Teamwork.